Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our lecture series on the Iranian Revolution at 40. This is our second lecture series in these series of lectures that seek to interpret, analyze, and discuss the significance and the impact of the Iranian Revolution 40 years later. Uh, when we put the lecture series together, we decided to invite uh, a prominent uh, series of social scientists to, to participate in the series, an anthropologist, a political scientist, a sociologist, a historian, and since we are located in a school of international studies that is very much interested in policy questions, we also decided to inv uh, invite a former uh, American diplomat who could participate in these lectures. When it came to selecting the historian for this series, uh, it was a very easy decision. The name Ervand Abrahamian was at the top of our list. And I'd like to introduce him by way of a short little story um, uh, about Ervand that most of you, I suspect, are unaware of. Um, a few years ago, I was designing a course here at the Corbell School on Modern Iranian History and Politics. And when I was sort of looking at the readings that I wanted to consider, I came across a reading uh, called uh, The Crowd in the Persian Revolution, published in the Journal of Iranian Studies um, by Ervand Abrahamian in the year 1969. And I turned to my friend Danny Postel, who some of you know, and I said, Danny, have you seen this journal article? It was published almost 50 years ago. Ervand must have been a teenager when he cranked out this article. Uh, and all of that just serves to highlight Ervand Abrahamian's intellectual prowess, his knowledge production, and his contributions to scholarship. Anyone who is serious about the field of modern Iranian history cannot avoid the work and the scholarship of Ervand Abrahamian. Uh, a few of his books, not all of them, that have been widely influential in terms of chronicling modern Iranian history includes his influential post-revolutionary book, Iran Between Two Revolutions, Khomeiniism, Essays on the Islamic Republic, Tortured Confessions, Prisons, and Public Recantations in Modern Iran, The Coup, 1953, The CIA and the Roots of Modern U.S.-Iranian Relations, and most recently, a book that's on sale outside of this room, A History of Modern Iran, uh, recently in an updated and expanded edition. Ervand Abrahamian holds the distinguished, holds the title of Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Iranian and Middle East History and Politics at Baruch College City University of New York, which has been his home, his academic home for the last 40 years. He's taught at universities of Oxford, Columbia, New York, Princeton, and in 2011, he was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. When he accepted our invitation, on the Iranian Revolution at year 40, he said he'd like to go back to 1953, the important year of the, um, of the American intervention in CIA coup to try and analyze and discuss and reflect upon the 79 revolution. And as you all know, once again, the United States is very much uh, involved with trying to shape internal Iranian politics today in the era of Donald Trump. I'm not sure if Erevand is going to talk about recent events, but we will certainly ask him about those events during the question and answer session. Um, it's a huge honor to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the great Ervand Abrahamian. Thank you, Nader, for that introduction. Uh, thank you for the center for inviting me, and thank you for all for sacrificing up such a beautiful day for to come and listen to about a dismal topic. Um, also, thank you for arranging wonderful weather here for uh, two days of visit. Um, the 40-year anniversary still draws a lot of attention for the revolution, and for good reason. If you look at the word revolution, it's often used as a sponge word to mean a lot of things, such as riots, revolts, uprisings, civil wars, uh, uh, movements of national liberation. Uh, but if you define revolution in its proper sense, the way it was used since the French Revolution, um, in 
dramatic, sudden change in the social basis of power, which is accompanied by transformation of the political system, the social system, and ideological system. If you define it that way, which is the true meaning of uh, revolution, uh, you find very few revolutions in history. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, in his famous book on the French Revolution, uh, writes that the French Revolution was a trans transcendental phenomena. And he says, fortunately, it'll only happen once in a millennium. Well, it may have exaggerated the millennium, but if you actually look at world history, there are not that many revolutions since the French Revolution. You can talk about the Russian, the Chinese, the Mexican, but often the ones we call revolutions are coups or uprisings that fail. But the Iranian Revolution does fit this very much model because there is very much a dramatic shift. It's just not just one group of people replacing the top people. There is a major, huge transformation of society, leading, in fact, to almost uh, over a million immigrants leaving the country as a result of that. And it has left, obviously, a deep imprint on not just Iranian history, but regional history. Um, so here, by, on its own account, it draws a lot of attention. Also, if you look at the academic world, uh, since 1979, because the television was almost literally televised, there were so many Western reporters there, you find that American social scientists oft invariably applied their own model of revolutions to Iran. So you have a huge library of works applying whether it's a Weberian notion or a Durkheimian motion or Tillian motion or even a Foucaultian motion or a Marxist motion. These, uh, uh, these uh, paradigms are applied to the revolution itself. So this creates a great deal of, you can say, already a library on the revolution. Besides that, uh, the, of course, the revolution was very closely followed by the embassies, both by the American embassy and the British embassy. And those archives are now open, yeah, so you could get a deep insight of what was happening uh, basically at a uh, live time at the time of how the people, the diplomats saw it. So from that ground, there's a lot of information about the revolution. What is striking is in the writings of whether academic or uh, dip diplomatic that the revolution came as such a surprise that people didn't expect it, that somehow they thought this was a very stable regime. Of course, at the time, the Shah had one of the largest armies in the Middle East, 400,000 men. He had one of the largest uh, bureaucracies, some 300,000 uh, civil servants, huge uh, secret police, uh, the Savak. Then you, uh, he was also basically swimming in money. The oil revenues had jumped from five billion to something like 20 billion by 1978. So from all objective level, if you look at the regime, it was a solid foundation. There was no problems. Uh, if it, there were any problems, he could deal with it because it was a real, like one of his huge dams that was built at that time. Uh, so people felt confident this was a regime to last. In fact, some of the NIEs, the national intelligence uh, estimates given by the uh, American uh, government, they were predicting that there wouldn't be any problems till 1985 when the regime was very stable. So what you find here is the unexpectedness of the revolution. I mean, most revolutions are pretty unexpected, but this one, I think, was more unexpected because the people saw the regime as a very solid, very viable regime. It had all the cards on its, in its hands, and all the aces. Um, there were people, of course, uh, who 
had other views, but they were usually disregarded. Uh, they were seen as basically not uh, experts on the area. So if you read uh, a, a journal like Monthly Review, uh, there was actually talking about uh, the regime was uh, unstable because uh, uh, it said the public, the, the regime viewed the masses as asses, but Iranian history it was full of cases where the asses overthrew the r elite. So there were ex expectations in the opposition that this revolution was co going to happen sooner or later. Uh, in fact, if you look at the student movement, there was a viable Iranian student movement in America and Europe. Invariably, their annual meetings would end up with the prediction that there was going to be a revolution soon. So much so, it became like a, a crying wolf. So after a while, even students started belie not believing in that. But there was always this counter-argument that there is uh, basically the regime is unstable. Um, and of course, what happened is once the revolution came, it unraveled very quickly. In 17 months of demonstrations, this formidable uh, fortress literally collapsed like a pack of cards. Um, you know, much of the academic works that were published, uh, there's a lot of good stuff. What, if you look carefully at them, what they're looking at is the, what I would call the short term, the triggers of the revolution. In the 1960s, uh, Lawrence Stone, who's a famous historian of the English Revolution, wrote this very good article in comparative politics, uh, called, as titled Theories of Revolution. And he makes a good distinction between causes of revolution. He separates the uh, triggers or short-term, medium causes from what he was called, so it describes as long-term, uh, fundamental causes. And if you look at the uh, literature on the Iranian revolution, they invariably look at the triggers. And there are plenty of triggers. But triggers could, don't cause revolutions. You really need something more fundamental. So for instance, the triggers that are often people focus on was Carter's human rights um, uh, campaign. So yes, that's true. There was a human rights campaign, not so much actually by Carter, but by human rights organizations like Amnesty. And the Shah felt pressure to uh, somewhat open up or liberalize. And some people latch on to this, and the re Republicans said, you know, the Democrats lost Iran as if Iran belonged to the United States, and blame Carter for, for the revolution. But if you think of it logically, what does that human rights campaign mean? It meant the Shah instructed Savak, uh, stop torturing people in prison. Okay, th that's true. But why should the regime collapse just because torture is stopped? There must be something wrong, more, more fundamentally wrong with their regime, th that it collapses just because people are not being tortured in prison. What sort of regime is it that tor collapses just because of that? Another short-term cause that's often given is the argument that there was sudden boom in the oil prices, but then there was a slight dip and this caused an economic crisis. So there's a lot written about the big economic crisis that triggered off uh, the revolution. But again, if you look at it, there was no real economic crisis. There was an evening out of oil revenues. That did not cause an economic crisis in Iran because the, the, the regime still had huge reserves abroad it could have cut down on its military expenditures, still use the money for economic development. It could have even necessarily borrowed money abroad because it had good credit. So the idea of economic crisis was often popular in academic circles because it fitted into the notion of the rentier state. The notion of rentier state is that if a state is dependent so much on oil, then it can have a disastrous crisis because oil prices suddenly shift. Uh, 
uh, decline. And this is fitted into their notion that, well, the revolution came because there was a, a slight de uh, evening out of oil prices. And the royalists, actually, the monarchists in Iran love this idea because it fits into their notion that the revolution wasn't really a popular uprising. It was triggered off by United States. They got tired of the Shah. They wanted to get rid of the Shah. So they uh, engineered with the Saudis this decline in oil prices. And this led to the revolution. Um, this uh, issue of the economic crisis also fitted in in academic circles well because um, right at the beginning of the Iranian Revolution, Thide Scotchpole wrote a very important book about comparative revolutions. Uh, she, it was uh, a comparison of the French, uh, Russian, Chinese revolutions. And her notion at that time was that became a basic uh, classic for understanding revolutions. Her argument was revolutions are not made by people. They're made because when there's a major crisis in the state, for instance, if there were foreign defeat or a foreign invasion or major bankruptcy for the state, the state collapses and then you have an uprising. So there the, the secret of a revolution is the state crisis in the state. So the idea of the rentier state and the slight decline in oil uh, price rises, that ex was fitted into this notion that what caused the Iranian revolution was an economic issue. But there was not really an economic crisis. In 1978-79, the e economy was overheated, but that wasn't because of decline in oil prices, because it was the massive expenditures the Shah had made earlier at the oil boom. So there was inflation, shortage of housing, shortage of electricity and stuff. So it, it was not the decline in oil prices that led to the revolution. So there were a lot of uh, arguments made about the revolution, but these tend to be basically triggers or the last uh, factors. Uh, one argument now that is often used, especially by the State Department people, is that the revolution occurred because the Shah was very weak in his attitudes. Uh, if the Shah was willing to use force uh, and they expected him to use force. If he had a crackdown, he could have easily controlled the situation. Um, again, this is basically then focusing on the individual to explain the revolution. They don't really go into the fact uh, that the Shah was quite actually here rational and uh, pragmatic. He knew that he couldn't use the army. His army was not dependable on this issue of being able to go out and shoot against relatives and stuff, people in the street. You're not dealing with a small uh, opposition. You're dealing with actually billions of people, uh, mass movement. And it uh, actually, at one point, the Shah says, well, I can control one block, but who's going to control the next block? And the army was not really that strong enough to be able to deal that. It wasn't a Pinochet type of disciplined army to do it. So much of these um, interpretations that are given are, are basically dealing with short-term causes. They don't deal with why the whole system basically collapsed within 17 months uh, with unarmed opposition people on the street day in, day out, and every month, really, the opposition got bigger and bigger in the, in, in the public sphere. Um, so in the post-mortems that were done, especially in the Foreign Office and in the State Department, and there are a lot of post-mortems saying, you know, you know, how come we didn't, we were taken by surprise? Uh, and they say they, their way of go, uh, defending themselves, they said, well, even uh, critics of the regime, and they used the name Fred Halliday, they said even Fred Halliday, who was very critical of the regime, he never expected a revolution, and therefore we can be actually absolved of not being able to predict the revolution. And in the State Department, uh, CIA, Foreign Office, the archives, they often actually, when they deal with the Shah through the 70s, 
They say there are problems in the regime. They're all very laudatory. They like the Shah. There's no question of that they, they want to get rid of the Shah. They basically consider him their basic, their gendarme in the Middle East. But they say there are problems. The problems being there's corruption, uh, there is inequality, there is the Shah is consolidating more and more power in his hands. But again, if you think about those things, uh, do those things enough to cause a revolution? Inequality, corruption, uh, autocracy. Uh, Trotsky, in his classic work on the Russian Revolution, at one point says that you know if uh, bad leaders incompetence at the high places is enough to cause revolution, then most countries would be in a permanent state of revolution. Similarly, you know, inequality, yes, you know, inequality causes a lot of discontent, but it doesn't necessarily cause revolution. We have more inequality in America now than we've had, you know, in our lifetimes. Probably more inequality here than in Iran, but obviously the U.S. is not on the verge of a revolution. So these uh, factors that they admit uh, don't really get to the core. The real issue that I would, I'm arguing is basically the regime collapsed because it had no legitimacy. Any regime with legitimacy, with some sort of social support, could have easily weathered these short-term problems. But the Iranian regime of the Shah lacked the, that legitimacy. And the lack of that legitimacy goes back really to 53. And if you uh, look at the crisis of 51, 53, the nas oil nationalization crisis, uh, the roots of a crisis can be actually seen all in that period. When oil was nationalized in April of 1951, uh, George McGee, who was the Under Secretary of State for under the Truman administration, rushed off to Tehran to persuade the Shah not to sign the nationalization bill. The State Department had a misunderstanding of the Iranian constitution. The Shah actually didn't have the constitutional power to, to do that. The um, parliament had already signed that. But once he got to Tehran, and this is all in the State Department, department uh, 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 archives, he discovered the mood was such that there was no way the Shah could resist. And there's a very revealing uh, conversation between the Shah and Henderson, who was the American ambassador. The Shah says to Henderson, look, I don't like this guy, Mossad there. They had other issues with Mossad there. Mossad was a strict constitutionalist, wanted the Shah to reign, not to rule. He didn't like Mossad there, but he said, I can't go against him because if I go against him, I'm going against the nation and the public will. He says, strong men like my father, Stalin, Hitler, it's interesting uh, images. As you, he says, they could be tough, but they had the public behind them. In this case, I don't have the public behind me. If I go against, the sh against Mossad there and oil nationalization, I will doom the monarchy. Uh, here, the Shah is often seen as incompetent in American media, especially after 1979. He's seen as an indecisive figure, uh, even used as a Hamlet figure that can't make up his mind. In fact, what you find in the Shah is a very different figure. He knows actually what he wants. He's very clever at getting what he wants. He knows what his cards are. I would say he's a shrewd politician. He, what he identifies here in 1951, which he kept through the crisis, oil crisis, is that nationalization of oil is a very crucial issue for the Iranian public. If he goes against it, he will doom himself and the monarchy. So instead of seeing him as a Hamlet figure, 
it's better to see him as a tragic figure in a Greek tragedy where you know the protagonist knows that if they do X, they are doomed, but they still end up doing X and doomed because of the stars, their fate, their destiny. In this case, obviously, is you can't use the stars to explain the Shah's inter uh, behavior. He was actually dragged by the British and the Americans to participate in the coup, despite all his reluctance. Basically, they told him by August of 53 that we're going ahead with the coup. If you're not on board, there is no guarantee that you'll still be king after the coup. Uh, we, in fact, are thinking of one of your brothers to replace you. So this was a, a basically an ultimatum blackmail. You either join us with the coup or, or else you're gone. So the, base, the shop, being pragmatic, has no choice. They're going to go along with the coup, so he might as well participate in the coup. So having done that, having participated in the coup, he knows how weak he is, that he is in fact gone against the oil nationalization against Mossadegh. Here to backtrack a moment, why is oil nationalization so important in Iranian consciousness? In Iran, true, was not a colony of Britain, like a classic colony. But it was a semi-colony in that most Iranians viewed the real power behind the throne, behind politics, as the British, because of the oil company basically ran the major resource. So for most Iranians, Iran was a semi-colony of Britain. So how do you become independent? How do you gain national sovereignty, national independence? Is to get rid of the British oil company. That for, Brit for Iran was a declaration of independence from the colonial power. So the oil crisis often in the West was seen as an issue about dollars and cents of royal, lo, lo, royalties about oil. In Iran, it was seen as basically as a declaration of independence from the British. And this was how it was seen actually through most of the world. When oil was nationalized, stream of congra congratulations came from newly independent countries like Pakistan, India, Ceylon, Burma, and other countries congratulating Iran for becoming independent. This was even seen as the same way in the conservative press in England. The Daily Telegraph, for instance, the way it covered it, it was saw it as another blow against the British Empire, another colony or another country breaking away and becoming independent. And uh, physically, you could see this when the oil was nationalized, when the, uh, the oil company flag was lowered over their offices in Abadan and the Iranian flag was flown up. This was seen both in England and Britain as another country becoming independent of the British Empire. So when the coup occurred, it wasn't just removal of a prime minister. It was seen as uh, undermining of national independence. It would be like other countries that became independent, like India, suddenly having a coup and the Indians who had been opposed to uh, independence suddenly became uh, now in charge of independence, uh, of the state. It would be undoing national, basically, declaration. And so the 1953 coup in Iran, you can call it the original sin of the, uh, the Shah, because from then on, he was seen as someone who was no longer really representing Iran. He had over, helped overthrow the symbol of Iranian independence, nationalism, and be created a new, uh, basically, puppet state of United States. So from the beginning, you can say he lacked this credibility. He wasn't willing to admit that. So you, but if you look at his behavior, you find throughout this period, he is obsessed by uh, Mossadegh. The name Mossadegh couldn't be used in the public arena. But uh, 
if you look at uh, his, the diaries of his confidant, Alam, who wrote these very detailed diaries, even at the peak of the Shah's power with the oil boom, uh, he was surprised that uh, Shah was still obsessed by Mossadegh. It was like a nemesis for him. For him, this was a figure that he was always the ghost of around him, hovering, because here again is the realistic side of the Shah, that really he knew that by going against Mossadegh and the oil nationalization campaign, he had in fact undermined the uh, monarchy. So what he often did um, throughout the 70s is a lot of uh, acrobatics, gymnastics, to cover this problem of legitimacy. Lacking national legitimacy, you have a major sort of somersaults. Uh, one is he tried to appear as at the, at the forefront of OPEC, of rising oil prices. And this was in a way to outbid uh, Mossadegh, that he was more militant than Mossadegh. Uh, but it also actually covered the fact, under cover, covered the fact that under the Shah, oil was denationalized, actually given back to Western oil companies, and Iran didn't have control over the oil industry. So he often grandstanded in OPEC about higher oil prices, but he really had no influence over determining over oil prices. It was more the countries, including the Saudi Arabia, that actually did control oil uh, production that could determine oil prices. So that was one gymnastics. Another gymnastics he did was um, try to latch on to 2,500 year history of Iranian monarchy. Uh, so it was saying, well, uh, uh, implicitly saying, I, if I don't have national legitimacy because of the oil crisis, I'm part of 2,500 year history of monarchy. So the grand shows he put in on Persepolis and so on, and much of the propaganda in the 70s was that it was an ongoing succession of 2,500 monarchy. This was more uh, saleable actually among Orientalists in the West than in Iran. It, it backfired in Iran because in Iran, actually, the idea of monarchy was considered something backward, something medieval. Uh, and they viewed, uh, they knew that his dynasty was an upstart dynasty uh, coming from 1925. They had, had no connection <laughs> with the Safavis, Achaemenians, and so on. So it was a misuse of it. And if you look at the uh, way the big Persepolis uh, uh, bash of all bashes, it was described as, where he invited a big, all the heads of state to come to Persepolis to celebrate 2,500 year history. Uh, again, it was a way to build up his image, but it backfired even among uh, the, uh, uh, the participants. For, first of all, Iranians weren't invited. Even members of the cabinet were not invited <laughs> to the show. It was a show for foreign uh, dignitaries. And the foreign correspondents, especially in Washington Post, they came out with a bad taste in their mouths. You know, it, to hear a great deal of poverty still in the country. They claimed there was a starvation, people barefoot. And meanwhile, you're spending billions of, millions of dollars bringing in food from Paris because you can't really serve foreign dignitaries Iranian food. You have to bring in the best food, wines from France, and so on. Um, so it became a joke. In fact, it is more of a joke now if you look at the sources than it was perceived at that time. Uh, some major figures didn't appear. Nixon uh, made excuses not to go. He sent uh, Agnew there. Uh, 
uh, and Agnew was pissed off because waiting in queues, he had to wait in line behind not just monarchs and uh, queens, but ex-monarchs and ex-queens. So he, he uh, got sulking and he went to his tent and hardly came out of his tent. So it hardly worked with, <laughs> with the American administration, but it was part of this campaign to have an alternate form of legitimacy by being seen as part of 2005 year history. It further undermined his credibility in Iran because for religious people, you had, latching onto this was seen as a way of undermining Islam. Uh, the Shah actually was a religious person. <laughs> More than that, he was a highly superstitious person. Uh, he often saw imams in his dreams. Imams told him what to do, and so he tried to legitimize his, his arguments more, more than Khomeini, actually, in bringing in the imams to politics. Uh, so he wasn't anti-religious, but using this type of symbolism undermined his credibility among the clerics because they said, hey, he's trying to undermine uh, our culture by talking about uh, the Achaemenians and the Safavids and so on. Um, another way he tried to gain legitimacy was to act as a strong man, i.e. he is now making Iran as a powerful state that people can have respect for by building up a military. And to do that, he became what was known as Nixon's policeman in the Middle East. And this again backfired because in Iranian language, when you're a gendarme of someone, <laughs> you're working for someone. So it was perceived in Iran that all this money that was going into building up was to a, become a puppet of the United States. This reinforced the, already the, uh, the lack of credibility because the more he spent on the military, the more he became powerful, not in the Persian Gulf, but in the Indian Ocean. He was seen among Iranian a na a nationalists, ah, well, this confirms our conv conviction that he was brought to power to serve American interests and so on. How many? Ten minutes. Oh, oh still, okay. So for me, the intriguing thing is that this was obviously the Achilles heel of the regime, the 53, the lack of credibility. But when you look at the documents, both the State Department and the Foreign Office, there is all this mention of inequality and other problems. They never mention 53. It's like a taboo subject. You can play around with it, but you can never mention that the problem is the coup of 53. This actually raises to me an interesting problem. Why didn't they mention this? These are, you know, rational, intelligent people. How come they don't mention 53 as a problem. And some speculation for that. One is, it may be a legal reason, that if you are in the government, the government de denies that there was a CIA MI6 uh, uh, coup, then if you suddenly say that, you're actually technically breaking the Official Secrecy Act. In England, not, re not long ago, their top scientist uh, revealed when during the uh, Saddam Hussein weapon of the mass destruction, he was the top scientist. He knew what was going. He happened to say, tell a journalist that the government was, the term he used was sexing up the dossier. And this was seen as a, uh, breaking the secrecy act. And he was actually suicided when he said that. So it was a serious offense to actually say something that goes against your government if you're a government official. So I think there's a reason people in the State Department, the White and the Foreign Office don't have any mention of this 53 coup. Uh, I found a document in uh, 
when the Iranian Revolution was at its peak, 78, there was a Labour Party conference in England, and the Labour Party was in the government at that time. A Labour MP writes to the Foreign Office saying, there's an Iranian here circulating a pamphlet saying that we were responsible 53 coup. Is there any truth in this? So the Foreign Office says, assigns a young intern, says, go and look at the archives. What do we have on our archives about the 53 coup? And this a young, um, uh, not too smart uh, <laughs> intern, comes back and says, I can't find anything. Uh, you know, I looked everywhere. There's no rec record of anything about us. I, this I, the intern didn't look too well because if you look at certain carefully enough, there are things, but not e implicitly, uh, explicitly, implicitly. Uh, for instance, you would uh, in fifty soon after fifty three when the British reestablished their embassy in Tehran, the ambassador writes a cryptic note to uh, uh, to uh, London saying. Uh, there are all sorts of wild rumors in Iran that the Americans had something to do with the coup. <laughs> Not saying that we are, okay, but the, somehow the Americans, it's a public notion. Obviously, he knew that there was involved, but he didn't want to mention it. Uh, there's also uh, a British ambassador in 54 writes to other ambassadors saying, if you want to know really what happened here, uh, look at these articles in the Times of India. And the Times of India had a journalist, a, a socialist deputy known as Reddy, and he happened to be friends with the ambassador. So he, he was in Tehran report as a journalist living with the ambassador, and he had kept his eyes open, ears open, and he wrote a series of articles and if you write, read those articles, they actually have a very accurate sequence of events leading up to the coup. There's no, nothing hidden about it. So what the British ambassador was saying is if you want to know about the MI6 uh, CIA coup, read these articles. So he, he's not saying we did the coup, but saying you know there's the evidence if you want to look at it. Um, so there, there was this knowledge of those people in, in 54, 55. Later on, when the diplomats came, uh, other younger diplomats, they, f they would not have had that personal knowledge. They only had written documents. And the, the written, written documents would not have referred to the 53 coup. I think legally there would all be psychological reasons, you know. You don't want to say that the real problem about the Shah is United States or Britain. So that's a psychological reason for not doing. Just to give you two vignettes, uh, when I was writing the book on the coup, I got an email from a former American diplomat who told me that he, before being sent to Iran in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, he was actually well trained. I think uh, diplomats were better trained then these days. So he was given courses on Iranian history. He was studied Iranian, uh, Persian to go there. And he said uh, he, the first time he heard about the coup was in 1960 when he was talking to a student in Mashhad, and the Mashhad student told him about the coup. He said he'd, ne he'd never heard about that. Here is a diplomat, you know, uh, this guy has been trained there, and there was obviously nothing in the files that he would have opened up to him that he, there was a coup. Another story uh, from a very senior diplomat, um, who later became ambassador elsewhere, He's, he uh, recounts that when he was in the embassy in Tehran, uh, he was studying Persian. And he was taking lessons from a well-heeled aristocratic lady. And then one day after class, he, this is tutorial, he asked the, this uh, aristocratic lady, who's your favorite Iranian? And 
she said without hesitation, it's Mossadegh. And he said, but he's been gone for 10 years. <laughs> uh, she said, well, yes, you Americans took him away from us. <laughs> and so he says, he th thinks, if this aristocratic lady thinks that way, I wonder what other Amer Iranians think in the public. So these are actually what later on can be admitted, but much later, until really 2000, the year 2000, the official line of the American government was that US had nothing to do with the coup. In Britain, still, the official line is the U Britain had nothing to do with the coup. So there's still the inhibition, legal inhibition in a Britain about mentioning it. In America, that inhibition has actually broken thanks to Albright. Because in the year 2000, Madeleine Albright said we had something to do with the coup. Well, but then she also said, well, it was in the context of the coup, uh, the Cold War. But that's a different story. I, I won't go into that. I, I think the coup had nothing to do with the Cold War, as far as I'm concerned. But it's, all use, it's, it's a good justification to put it in the context of the Cold War. So since then, you do find people, uh, former diplomats, occasionally mentioning that the problems were 53. Uh, just to give you uh, two uh, examples. Uh, John Stemple, who was the second man in the embassy during the revolution, 78, 79, he wrote a book called Inside the Iranian Revolution. And he admits that the problem the Shah had was that whenever he tried to negotiate with the opposition, no one in the opposition considered him legitimate. So how can you negotiate with people who don't consider you legitimate? So he admits that the real Achilles we heel of the, uh, of the revolution was uh, origins of the, re of the state. But he, he doesn't, is not willing to actually go and link it to 53. So he, his book came out before 2000. So he could have just been inhibited by that. And a later book uh, in 2009, written by William Polk, who used to be in the foreign policy uh, uh, State Department uh, group. And I suspect he had a role, because he's an older man, would have been there in 53. He has a book, it's a short book, Introduction to Iran. But he there, as for me, it's very revealing. He says that the 53 coup really delegitimized the regime. And from then on, the regime was weak. So the people like him, former State Department people, who had been there in 53, were quite aware of the problem. But they couldn't really articulate it until basically after 2000. Um, so here you have an interesting, actually academic interest. If you are studying something just by written sources, you look at the State Department sources, for, uh, Foreign Office sources, for the origins of the coup, you're never going to find 53 coup. It's not because it wasn't important. It was, I would say, the exact opposite. It was so important that it couldn't be mentioned. It was a taboo topic. But this was a something that people, the Shah knew, the public, Iran, Iranian public knew, and it was the main cause of the weakness. Other factors, of course, came in, but just to put it in sort of distance causes, all the problems the Shah had could have easily been solved. But to have solved those problems, you needed to have some legitimacy. And lacking with legitimacy mean, like even if you try to, let's say autocracy is too much, you try to open up the system. As soon as you open up the system, sooner or later someone is going to say, you know, what's your legitimacy? So at the end of the revolution, 
uh, and in 78, the Shah made this famous speech to the pu public, you know, apologized to the public. He said, now I'll, I'm a constitutional monarch. I appoint the prime minister. I'll listen to you. And this was seen as a joke. You spent the last 25 years making a mockery of the Constitution. <laughs> Suddenly, you become a constitutional monarch. We know that, basically, you got power out of a military coup. And that military coup was engineered for you by the MI6 and uh, CIA. So this basically becomes, I would say, the long-term cause of 1979. So although there's a big gap in terms of dates, there is in, ter in terms of historical memory, there is a strong, in Iran, a strong link between 53 and 79. I'll stop there. OK. Well, thank you very much, Ervon. I want to get the, um, I mean, those are wonderful, insightful, you know, retrospective reflections on the Iranian revolution, its causes. Um, and I completely agree with you that the question of political legitimacy of the Shah was the key essential factor in explaining the revolution. I was wondering if I could get you to reflect for a moment and compare the crisis of legitimacy that the Shah faced with the crisis of legitimacy that the Islamic Republic today is facing in the eyes of its own citizens. So just to give you an example, um, about two months ago, a prominent uh, clerical authority, the head of Tehran's revolutionary court, a man by the name of Musa Qazan Farabodi, gives a speech where he explicitly talks about young people in Iran sort of not supporting the revolution. And he explicitly says that if we ever reach a moment where things are getting desperate for the Islamic Republic, we will have to invite into Iran various non-Iranian Shia militia that we have supported throughout the region, and he actually lists the names of these groups, to come into the country to defend the Islamic Republic. And just a few weeks ago, in the context of this flood crisis, these Iraqi Shia militia known as the Hashd al-Shabiyya have actually come in to Iran to um, provide flood relief, and this has generated uh, controversy within Iran. Um, I mean, the crisis of legitimacy of the Islamic Republic, I would argue, particularly among young people, particularly in the urban sectors, is so vast and so deep that you have this situation where after 40 years of the Islamic Republic trying to cultivate an ideal Muslim citizen and raising people on a diet of Islamic teachings and beliefs. You have vast and ex expansive social secularization. People don't pray anymore. People don't fast. People don't observe the normal rituals in ways that, you know, speak to, I think, highlight. I mean, there's a lot of other things that I could mention here. So. Um, what are the comparative similarities and differences, I guess, in terms of the um, crisis of legitimacies that these two authoritarian moments in Iran, the Shah and then the Islamic Republican period are facing? Um, there obviously are similarities, but there's obviously differences. And if you could begin by maybe commenting on those um, similarities and differences, uh, we would benefit from your insights. I mean, there, there are a lot of parallels in that it's, the Islamic Republic, especially in the last 10 years, uh, has become un, very unpopular among certain groups in Iran. Uh, so there is this alienation. Uh, and people then could see it as another sort of cycle, that, that another revolution duplicating the 79 revolution. Um, I think the complications there is that the 79 revolution, even now, you can say, uh, losing support, it still was a very popular revolution. It really it was involved with massive people. Uh, Kurzman, who's written a book on the Iranian revolution, um, he argues that there was more popular participation in the Iranian revolution than in any other, any other revolutions. And if revolutions by definition are popular movements, then this was quite something. So that still resonates. Um, 
among people that you know there there is some legitimacy because the origin of the rev the republic is after all a popular revolution, while the origin of the Shah's regime was a CIA coup. So it, that difference. Then there's another factor. I think this um, because that the legitimacy of the revolution, then of course the war has helped because the revolutionary guards fought against the Iraqi invasion. This gives the revolutionary guards, the Basij, some sort of legitimacy. They may not be liked by uh, educated uh, middle class, but they still have uh, some strength especially in the rural countryside. In fact, they're often recruited from the countryside, from families who've had martyrs in the war or the, uh, or the revolution. So there is a network of people who have, or their personal fate is linked to the regime. Under the Shah, actually, although he had a huge army, and had been trained by the Americans since 1942, actually. That army was very unreliable when it came to dealing with uh, public protests. And I think that's where another way the Shah was actually quite much more savvy about the situation than uh, foreigners were, because he knew that most of his army were, in fact, rank and file citizens doing con conscripted. So if you ask them to shoot onto crowds, they would be shooting onto their relatives. And throughout the demonstrations, actually, 17 months of demonstrations, although the public perception was that thousands of people were killed, the official figure given was 60,000 martyrs in the demonstrations. I've calculated from official figures, actually, instead of 60,000, it's more like 600. So you have to remove quite a few zeros. Real figure was probably 600. And the reason for that was that uh, rank and file soldiers were never asked to shoot. When there was any shooting, it was done by officers. And this is, shows the the, actually the implications that the Shah really couldn't ex accept a big crackdown. Uh, and if he had accept, he wanted a big crackdown, it would have either led to a civil war or the, the complete disintegration of the army. So he, ne he never resorted to that. While, in fact, people like Brzezinski were saying, well, you have a huge army, just crack down, get rid of them, arrest everyone, kill some people, everything will end up. And actually, the Sullivan, the American ambassador, uh, poo-pooed all that. He gave a very realistic situation that he, the Shah just couldn't do that. There was, this, this army was not something he could do. The Islamic Republic, you know, however bad it is, it does have the people who are willing to break heads and even shoot people if necessary. Why? Because they, from their perception, the regime is legitimate. So however much opposition there is, unless there is some reason for a breakdown of the guards, I, I can't see a repetition of 79. Uh, we, have a microphone. we have a microphone for questions so that it can get picked up. We have a question here at the front and then hide it. So we'll two questions and then we'll move forward. Hello? Salam. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful, as usual. And um, I have two comments. One is that regarding the last point, the difference between the crisis of legitimacy today and back then is the right to vote is the republic in the Islamic Republic. When the people of Iran or any other country taste sovereignty and popular legitimacy as manifested in the so-called yeah. republic, that's, that's like an aphrodisiac that, that, that they, they, 
that people, once they taste it, they, they can never go back, so to speak. And so that's one, and I was wondering about what you thought about that. The other reflection is the, among the somersaults that you correctly pointed out, is this thing called the White Revolution in early 60s. And these were, as you know, a number of American dictators in part reforms in order to mimic Mossadegh's yeah. in, in my opinion, in order to buy pseudo-legitimacy. Exactly, I think yes. the so-called white revolution, uh, i.e. bloodless revolution, yeah. which was then yeah. propagandized, I had to, I had to study it in high school um, by force, of course. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering about reflecting on legitimacy, these two points. Yeah. Actually, I, I, two, two, two very good points. I, I, in, in my talk, actually, one of the just summer sources I had, I didn't have time to get, it was exactly the White Revolution. It was, again, very much trying to get new legitimacy, saying, saying, well, you know, the, the others may have national, but I'm a great revolutionary. I'm going to completely reform the countryside and so on. Again, this backfired because for actually the National Front, their, their argument was that reform, yes, dictatorship, no. So that, you know, you can make economic reforms, but their real issue is uh, legitimacy, uh, uh, political change, which he couldn't do because as soon as if he opened up the question of legitimacy. Uh, and a lot of the, the tr land reform, again, is in a way backfired because although in theory it would sort of created a base for the regime, and this was the American thinking that if you have peasants who are now uh, f small farmers, they've got the land from the state, this, they'll be obliged to support the state. It, it works in some places like in South Korea and so on. But in Iran, it didn't work well because it wasn't followed through. Arsene Johnny, who started the reform, had a fairly good idea, but the Shah got very jealous of him, got rid of him, and then the, it fizzled out because the supply, the uh, support system that farmers needed was never given. So they were left with land, and a lot of people, peasants didn't get land. So they flooded into the cities, and this created an added problem which they didn't expect out of the White Revolution. So th there's that, pro the, the, the White Revolution, I would say, yes, is a somersault which didn't help, it just backfired. Uh, the question of voting is, I think, very important, because I think the main legitimacy the regime has it often talks about, well, Islam and so on. But often, if you look carefully, their argument is that we have elections and we have mass participation. And if I was them, I would actually lecture <laughs> the Obama, uh, not Obama, but the, tr the Trump administration, you know, what's your democracy? At most, you get 55% of the electorate to participate. What sort of election? democracy is that we can have as much as 80 percent and it's not coerced it will actually it's not like a stalinist election where people are told to go and vote people generally vote 80 percent if you get actually 50 percent 60 percent this is considered a, 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 a bad reflection on the regime so the high participation is their way of saying we are legitimate but to have that uh, high percentage, you need to have competition. To have competition, you have to have really someone who's a conservative and someone who's somewhat more moderate or reformer. So they won't accept, of course, anyone from the monarchist or leftist because that would be outside the perimeters. But within that con uh, perimeter of reform Islam or conservative Islam, you have to have that to get people to vote. 
if there isn't that vote, then people stay home. And then the legitimacy of the regime is then fallen. And that's where I would say, actually, if that happens, if future elections are completely controlled and only one candidate is running, or Tiddle D and Tiddle Dam are running exactly the same, people have the choice to stay home. So if the electoral voting goes down to 50%, then that loses the credibility of the regime. And then I would say Iran is in a pre-revolutionary situation. Thank you for such a wonderful and educational talk and a historian's perspective. Uh, uh, I want to pursue um, uh, the previous discussion, uh, perhaps with a slight twist, uh, uh, and ask you to give more of a historian perspectives than you gave already. Um, uh, we uh, know uh, that uh, uh, legitimacy uh, is something in a revolutionary situation uh, um, that is uh, important because the rulers can no longer rule in the old way when they don't have legitimacy. The other factor is that the rule also don't want to be ruled in the old way. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it seems that one way to phrase uh, what you're saying, and by the way, I think the Shah is a mixture of uh, tragedy, comedy, and farce, you know, to paraphrase uh, 18th Brunner's yeah. beginning. Um, uh, uh, we could uh, ask ourselves, uh, uh, what was it uh, in the circumstances of um, the second Iranian, well, first one was a coup, <laughs> the real Iranian revolution um, uh, in 78, 79, uh, that allowed uh, the mullahs actually to dominate. There was Bazargan, there was uh, Bani Sadr, uh, there were the Mujahideens, uh, uh, there was even the son-in-law of uh, uh, Dr. Mossadegh. Uh, so can you throw some historical light as to how the mullahs gained hegemony over the movement, and how they maintained the hegemony, uh, uh, perhaps in addition to just this uh, uh, one person, one vote, yeah. uh, uh, say, not where, yeah. et cetera. Well, the, the usual answer to that uh, given actually not just by monarchists, leftists, no, is that the revolution was hijacked. So it was many people involved, and then the clique behind Khomeini took over. I, I think this is a simplistic interpretation. W what you do get is, uh, yes, those people, in a way, had more le ties to 53. You could say they had a longer history of opposing the Shah, but it was Khomeini and his circle that basically took over. Now, then the, why? I don't think it's just a hijacking. When the state broke down, or the top of the state, what you get is on the local level, you know, village, uh, neighborhood level, uh, people who took over it was very, very grassroots uh, people, usually high school students, young college gr uh, students. Uh, they were called bacheha, you know, as lads, local lads. Uh, they were, and they became the core of the Revolutionary Guards. They gravitated much more to Khomeini. Uh, they considered people like Bazar Ghan, uh former National Front, as basically too liberal to bourgeois and so on. Uh, so they, I think the secret, the secret answer, uh, explanation to why those grassroots people looked at Khomeini as the, their guard, their leader, and I think the clergy already had their own structure, but interestingly, the clergy really didn't come into the revolution until pretty late. Uh, you have actually oral histories from these uh, kids. One of them says, you know, they were tried to, to, in 77, early 78, they were trying to organize their local mosque against the Shah. The mosque, uh, Mullah, threw them out of the mosque. They didn't want anything to do with this. So they arranged the demonstration stuff basically outside. 
And then at the final days, he, he, he was surprised to see the, the, the mullah who had thrown them out in the street with a Kalashnikov, you know, calling for the death of the Shah. So they came in very late. But of course, once they came in, they had already their structures, so they, they could take over. But I think that in, intellectually, there's another aspect that's often forgotten is Max Weber actually comes in useful here. Max Weber promised to write something on revolutions. He didn't, because most of his work is actually on stability, continuity, longevity. And, but he obviously struggling, how to, can you have revolutions when you, know, you have institutions, stability? And the only thing he wrote about revolutions was 1905 when the Russian Revolution broke out. Those articles have just been published. And interesting, if you look at those articles, they're not Weberian. <laughs> they're actually Marxist. He adopts a Marxist analysis to understand what happened in Ru Russia in 1905. But still, Marx is uh, Weber ever is interesting for Iran on the issue of charisma. Because for uh, uh, Weber, just to remind you, for him, uh, legitimacy, authority, comes from, on one level, uh, tradition, custom. Then the modern level, he, uh, you could say institutional, rational, he would call it. But when you have a breakdown of traditional legitimacy, and I would say in Iran that was broke down precisely because of 53, what you get is a vacuum. And in a vacuum, you, for uh, Weber, you get the emergence of charisma. So it's not a charisma that creates revolution. It's a revolutionary situation that creates a charismatic person. So that here, when the old order really the legitimacy breaks down, here someone emerges who is the charismatic figure. And in history, actually very rare to find such figures. Uh, even Lenin really didn't have that charisma. The charisma was created posthumously. <laughs> uh, with Mao, you can say, yes, that charisma is there, Ho Chi Minh. But usually, it's very rare to have one person who appears as the epitome of sort of the nation. And Khomeini does that, I don't think so much because of himself, but because there is this vacuum. And he is able to use that because of Shiism. So the Shi culture there is very important. So the fact that he appears as the, someone who is the, interesting, the, he's not described by his followers as a ayatollah or grand ayatollah, but as an imam, a term that was never used in Iran for political figures because imams are infallible. Imams are somewhere between us and God. But applying that term for Khomeini was something that his, you can say, grassroots followers really did. And for him, he was the word. So uh, again, going to uh, Weber, he says, uh, with charisma, uh, you know, the charismatic factor says, the law says unto you, do this, but I say unto you, do that. <laughs> I, what I say is overcomes what the law says. This is precisely what Khomeini was saying. And in fact, he was contradicting a lot of uh, Shi traditions by, by saying, you know, these traditions maybe have been there, but I'm telling you something else. And what I tell you is more important because his followers look, looked upon him as a charismatic figure. You couldn't go against his word. So I think that complication comes in to explain why? And even you know, people like Bazar Ghan, who were very critical of privately of his policies, publicly couldn't go against him. Because if they went against him, it was uh, destroying their political career. They would be then smeared as anti-Shi, anti-revolutionary. Okay, let's take maybe one 
two more questions. Okay, actually, th I see three hands, and then we'll cut it off. So, one, two, three. Go ahead at the back. Hi, um, this is Jay. Thank you so much for coming out there. Um, my question has to do with sort of more modern times, but um, I would just like to know from your historical perspective, noting the U.S. involvement in um, the 1953 coup and then since then, um, where do you see maybe opportunities for improved relations between the U.S. and Iran? And then also, what are some of the modern barriers to that? I mean, we saw the fallout of the TPPOA, um, but what is your perspective on current relations and where they might be able to go from here? Uh, well, I mean, the, the best uh, optimism is if U.S. goes back to the Obama administration policy. Could you repeat the question so they can get picked up? Oh, yeah. The question was, you know, what are the prospects or what are the possibilities of uh, improved relations between the two countries? Uh, the only, I think, possibility is if we return back to the Obama, because I think K Kerry and Obama had the realistic evaluation of the situation. They may not want the Islamic Republic, but it's there. The best thing is to be able to negotiate and so on. Um, the Trump administration has the policy clearly that they want to do the, uh, regime change. Uh, so the, the choice is whether economic pressures will bring regime change, which they hope. But if that doesn't work out, then I'm sure they'll escalate to more confrontational, maybe even military ventures. So we could see a replay of the Iraqi situation. Second to last question. Yeah. Wait, where's the microphone? Oh, no. Yeah, OK, so, so um, if you could give, no, give, your hand was up. Give the microphone to that young man right there. Just hold on for a second until the microphone comes so we can pick up the question on the sound system. Thanks for your question. I'm going to ask a question about the future, something like that question. But uh, for uh, me, for example, as an Iranian who lived since several years ago in Iran, I know that the majority of Iranians are not satisfied with the power, maybe yeah. want to have reform change. Uh, but uh, we cannot see any good alternative for that. What do you, because as you also mentioned, we are talking about the change of regime. Uh, what's your prediction for the future when there is no uh, alternative? How it would be uh, reform and change in Iran? Uh, I'll, do, I'll do the historians uh, to catch out. You know, I, I, not in pro prophecy. I can't predict the future because <laughs> there's so many unpredictable. Could you just repeat the question? Okay. The question, what are, what are the possibilities of reform or change? Um, it so much depends on outside forces, you know. Uh, Iran is only a player in it, and the major gorilla in the room is basically the United States. So depends what United States do. I think if o the Obama administration had c continued and th th this po po the policy had continued, there would have been much more prospect for the uh, moderates, Rouhani, to cons consolidate economic uh, improvements. And then that could, uh, not in inevitable, that can, but that could have led to more opening up. And I think the actual rev the Constitution itself is flexible enough to permit changes, as long as it remains a nominally uh, Islamic republic. There are enough clauses in the Constitution to have referendums and uh, bring about changes. But the diehards that have and control basically the uh, the court system, the judiciary, uh, they are, I would say, the strongholds for conservatism. But the reformers could challenge that if there was basically the international context for it. Uh, and there, I think, I mean, there is enough pressure in Iran of uh, really, uh, I wouldn't call it secularism, but um, basically change of Islam to conform basically to with uh, modern concept of legality and law. Uh, so it's, it's not the, you can find plenty of uh, religious leaders whose interpretation of, of the Sharia is quite compatible with a Western concept of law. So it's the diehards who basically say, no, we have to re remain faithful to the traditional interpretations. Yeah. Yeah.
Actually, it's a good point because the question is, you know, the Shah's actually hubris or arrogance by 77, 78, he started lecturing the West that the West was pr too promiscuous, too lazy, um, the wasting money that they deserve to higher oil prices and stuff. That this was then um, undermined him because the West was less supportive of him. It's, the public image is often that because that had the headlines. The trouble, the looking at the actual government documents, you get a different picture. So the apex of the, of the hubris was when uh, the Treasury Secretary Simon of the Nixon administration called the Shah a nutcase. And people remember that's because here, the American government is calling the Shah not because he's calling for higher oil prices. And so that remains in the image, public image, especially in, in Iran, that the Shah was actually very militant on oil prices. And this is why he was undermined. Um, not necessarily the oil companies conspired to bring him down, but this alienated the West because he was lecturing the West and calling for. What I found uh, surprised in the government documents is the Shah's uh, militancy on oil prices only lasted a few months. Uh, within a few months, actually, the British were saying the Shah is no longer calling for oil prices in private. Um, and Abu Zagar, who was the oil negotiator, he hated to be called a hawk on oil prices. Mm -hmm. So you have two levels, the public image, private image. In, in the private dealings, the Shah was actually very double-talking, very dishonest. He was, it, he was willing to fill up the American oil reserves, you know, these caves where oil was to be, at prices well below the OPEC prices. And uh, he was, when he was talking about criticism of Israel, he made it clear that there was no way he wanted a, a Palestinian state, and he was the main seller of oil to Israel. So again, privately, he was doing something very different. And his talk about you know, criticism of the West, uh, you find that he often worked for the, uh, the American administration in Africa. So when South Africa was, uh, uh, on the sanctions, but South Africa was supporting guerrilla movements in Mozambique, Angola, and stuff. Uh, the Shah was secretly funding those movements. So he was doing things, uh, dirty work for the West. So people like Kissinger actually knew that, and they were very thankful for the Shah for all he did. So there's one level, the public image that he's critical of the West, but in private, he was actually the best friend the U.S. could have had. So that, that wasn't that issue that uh, undermined him. Okay, very good. Uh, please join me in thanking Erevan Abrahami. Thank you very much.